Hello, everyone. My name is Kalev Bendor. I'm um, deputy editor of the Fathom Journal. I'm joined with Fathom editor Alan Johnson, and we are extremely pleased to be joined also by Shani Moore, uh, who we've both known for many, many years. In a, in a previous life, many years ago, he was senior research associate at BICOM. He's now, amongst other things, a lecturer in political thought at Reichman University in Herzliya. He's a former director for foreign policy at the Israeli National Security Council. I personally feel very um, exposed that I don't have any wonderful books in, in the background, uh, primarily because the Wi-Fi in the office is, uh, is not as good as, as, in the, as, in the, uh, as in the living room. But anyway, putting that aside, um, Shani, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So the reason we have invited you here is you've just written a, a fabulous essay uh, in Mosaic magazines called Ecstasy and Amnesia in the Gaza Strip, where, where you kind of touch on um, one way of looking at the history of the Israeli-Palestinian or the Israeli-Arab conflict. Could you just kind of briefly summarize for us um, your, your main arguments in, in the piece, please? Sure. I think my arguments stem from, uh, I should say that my, my basic question is what makes the Palestinian situation special? Is it special um, as a, a frustrated national liberation movement or as a national liberation movement with certain demands, um, most of which right now are, are unmet and unrealized? Um, is it special um, and is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict special in any way as well? And my basic conclusion is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on its own isn't special or shouldn't be special, but the Arab-Israeli conflict is actually quite special, and it is what makes the Israeli-Palestinian conflict special. My topic is, what is the, the Palestinian predicament? So I say there's a couple characteristics to it. The two big ones are nationhood and statelessness, right? Um, uh, being a nation, which is you know, a kind of ambiguous and amor amorphous concept that has all sorts of problems built into it, but that are not unique to the Palestinian case in the slightest in terms of not knowing where your nation begins and where it ends, having a sort of partly mythological uh, history, um, uh, having a resort to violence to, to meet its ends. None of this is special. It's true for the Palestinians. It's true for the Israelis. It's true for the Bulgarians, the Greeks, the Armenians, lots of post-imperial nations. Um, nationhood and statelessness is a bit rare, but also not exceptional, true for others as well. Kurds would be a wonderful example, and others. What makes the Palestinian predicament uh, special is not just nationhood and statelessness, it's nationhood, statelessness, plus three more dire characteristics, uh, displacement, occupation, and fragmentation. The argument of my essay is that almost all of the Palestinian predicament, almost all of the dire situation that the Palestinian cause and the Palestinians as people face today are uh, the outcome of three Arab-Israeli wars, three wars that are actually really different from each other. The wars that began in 1947, 1967, and 2000. These are three wars that actually have very little in common with each other, which is why I think the, the argument that I'm making has to be backed up, right? Because um, because they're actually radically different wars, but picking out the few things that are in common with those three wars, um, I think actually is a, is a very instructive intellectual exercise. Let me address briefly what those three wars are, why they're different, and maybe even more briefly, what I've left out by focusing only on those three wars and why I think it's okay to leave those other things out. Um, let's first deal with what I've left out in terms of what I've left out is either major historical events or processes, right? And the, the, those include uh, in terms of historical events that are very important in getting to where the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian people are today. They include, for example, the civil war in Jordan in 1970, uh, the much longer civil war in Lebanon from 1975 to 1990, um, the, the Gulf War uh, in Iraq, Kuwait, and later the uh, International Coalition in 1990-91, all those have an enormous impact on, obviously, on, on the Palestinian cause. I leave those out of my essay because I think the impact is either very tiny or encapsulated in the three wars that I'm discussing. And other things that I leave out of my essay in terms of longer historical processes, uh, the, the Cold War, 
the rise and fall of pan-Arabism, the rise and fall and rise again and fall again of political Islam. Um, also, obviously big things in, in the story. Um, my argument is, again, that on their own, not hugely impactful, except in where it touches to the three wars that I'm focusing on. So, so let's talk about those three wars um, and how different they are. The war that begins in 1947 um, is essentially a, at first, uh, civil war between Arabs and Jews in Palestine, um, and eventually becomes a multi-state, multi-front war between a newly born Israel and um, all of its Arab neighbors, um, including uh, uh, really the, the largest of them, Egypt, and the most modern and best trained army of them, uh, the Arab Legion from Jordan, which is essentially a British army at that point. Um, uh, or, or in, in many ways is, and probably the most for, formidable tactical um, opponent that, that the, the IDF has in 1948. It's a war that lasts over a year, um, and it's a war that's fought initially, um, it's a total war in, in territorial terms. It's fought village by village, town by town, hilltop by hilltop. Um, anywhere where it takes place, uh, nothing is left untouched. Um, and it includes massive demographic movements, uh, most notably, obviously, for historical purposes, and because we're still dealing with the issue today, a huge displacement of Arabs in Palestine, roughly 600,000, maybe slightly more, up to 700,000, depending on, on different estimates. Um, also a huge displacement of Jews in Palestine, by the way. This is more forgotten. About 25% of the Jewish population in Palestine is displaced over the course of the war. Um, and uh, uh, wherever they're displaced from places that are conquered by Arab armies, they don't return. Um, uh, but where they're displaced in places that become part of Israel, they either come back or they resettle somewhere else. Um, uh, this is not a, a massive refugee crisis that's remembered in Israel. In fact, it's the third and by far the smallest one um, that the new state of Israel deals with. Um, the much more acute ones are um, European Jews who are coming in from um, DP camps and from Cyprus immediately after statehood in 48. And then, of course, the enormous wave of, of Jews from Arab and Muslim countries um, from the late 1940s. Um, really continuously um, through the entirety of the 1950s and onward. Um, so the, the displacement of, of Jews in Palestine is, is kind of a really distant memory because even its numbers are, are small, though again, as a percentage, it's huge. In the article, I point out that there's a big difference between uh, what's happening in the north and the center and the south of the country. If you want me to expand on that, maybe in the questions, I'll get into that because I think it's also instructive about the, the, the differences between those three parts um, of mandatory Palestine actually also are instructive for, for understanding something about um, the conduct of that war. And that war ends with armistice agreements um, resulting in clear lines on the map, lines that are not international borders, but um, that function as de facto borders and that hold for 19 years. The next war um, it begins uh, 20 years later in 1967, and this is entirely a war fought between four armies, um, Israel, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. It's a very rapid war. It takes place memorably over six days. Um, it involves civilians almost not at all, on the Israeli side, not at all, pretty much, and on the Arab side, very little as well. Um, it's so rapid, by the way, that it doesn't involve a huge amount of uh, uh, demographic shifts in quite the way the 1948 war uh, does, with the exception of the Golan, um, the territory that's conquered by, by Israel from Syria. Uh, and, and, um, and its political context is very different, too, in terms of its ideology, in terms of uh, it's the height of pan-Arabism. Um, but it's, it's, it's a fully militarized conflict that's extremely rapid, um, with a very decisive victory for Israel. The third one begins in the autumn of 2000, following the um, uh, Palestinian rejection of um, uh, an Israeli and an American mediated peace offer at Camp David at the end of final status talks at the end of the Oslo process. And this war looks nothing like the previous two. Um, it has aspects of a uh, terrorist campaign inside Israel. It has aspects of an armed uprising um, and a counterinsurgency by an occupying army in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and it takes a good four years or so um, for it to be completed, uh, with the high point being in 2002 at the peak of the suicide bombing campaign and Israel's offensive in the West Bank, known to Israelis as Operation Defensive Shield. 
Um, that was the military operation in April that definitively broke the back of the Second Intifada and of the, the suicide bombing campaign in Israel. But the, the conflict itself continues for at least two more years um, and really winds down only after Arafat's death in November of 2004. So those are three completely different wars, right? Um, in terms of their duration, in terms of the nature of the combat, in terms of who the belligerents are, right? Um, the third one is really just Israelis and Palestinians. Um, the first one is Jews and Arabs in Palestine, and then also other states. The second one is really just the armies of, of four sovereign states. And yet my argument is that these wars or their outcomes are what create the Palestinian predicament. In fact, remember the things that I said describe the Palestinian predicament, not just nationhood and statelessness, but displacement, occupation, fragmentation. Each of those three last ones maps on perfectly to one of those three wars. The, the big catastrophic outcome for the Palestinians of the war that begins in 47 and doesn't really end until 49 is displacement. Uh, the big catastrophic outcome for the Palestinians of the war that begins in uh, June of 67 and ends in June of 67 is occupation. In other words, they're not only now displaced by some hated enemy above some beyond some impenetrable line, they're also now being ruled by an occupying army of that hated enemy after 67. And the outcome of the war that began in 2000 is this fragmentation. So this state in the making that was built over seven years in the Oslo process that had its own stamps and passports, its own armed forces, its own international airport, um, embassies and consulates around the world. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and that was on the cusp of, of uh, ruling over um, all of Gaza and um, more than 90% of the West Bank, including uh, much of East Jerusalem, it is gone and turns into this um, pockmarked um, area of, on the one hand, um, a completely separate regime in Gaza uh, under Hamas, for now. Don't know how much longer that's going to be the case. Um, and um, this uh, um, uh, checkerboard um uh, interim status that becomes semi-permanent of areas A, B, and C in the West Bank of the Palestinian Authority, where not only has the interim status become semi-permanent, it was supposed to last for five years, it's now been more than 25, but that even the distinction between those areas has been sort of effaced. Since 2002, uh, the IDF doesn't regard areas A as being essentially off-limits um, the way it did during uh, uh, the uh, nine years before that, uh, it, uh, no, the eight years or so before that in the Oslo period, and it, Oslo period, and even the first two years of the Second Intifada. Um, with, with that prospective statehood seemingly unrecoverable, um, at, at least from the vantage point of um, the present and, and all the years um, since uh, the violence that erupted in 2000. That, that's the basic argument about those three wars. From there, I continue and I want to say, well, what's in common to these three these three wars that are so different from each other? What do they actually have in common? Should I pause here? Do you have a question about that? Or do, do you want me to launch straight into that? No, I think I think launch in. And then obviously this comes in the context of, of 2023 as well. Sure. Okay. okay. So let's talk about a few small things, I think, that, that those three wars have in common. Um, and um, maybe they matter, maybe they don't. Um, so one thing that's true about those three wars and that wasn't true about other Arab-Israeli wars was the centrality of Jerusalem. Well, I, 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 and I, I leave open whether that's a coincidence or not, right? But Jerusalem matters a great deal in the war that begins in 47. Um, it matters a great deal in the war in 67. And it matters a great deal in, in uh, the, the war that begins in 2000. And other Arab-Israeli wars were um, about the Suez Canal or, or Beirut, uh, you know, or, or you know, things like that. Um, and um, so that's one. Uh, the other thing that's, um, and this is a bit more important now, um, 
uh, than the Jerusalem issue that's very important for the these three wars in particular is that the run-up to these wars is full of eliminationist rhetoric about Zionism and about the Jewish presence in the Middle East at all. Um, and that's not so true about other wars. I mean, other wars are remembered very traumatically by Israelis as being existential dangers, you know, particularly in 1973, arguably even in 1982. Um, but they weren't part of the Arab war aims in quite the way they were uh, in 47, 67, and 2000. And I think that has a big part of why the defeat ends up being so traumatizing and in so many ways um, so unresolved um, in a way that uh, other Arab wars against Israel, uh, which also led to defeat for the most part, um, do end up coming to a rapid political conclusion as well, sometimes through indirect negotiations, sometimes through some kind of um, international mediation or uh, an internationally imposed uh, uh, line or ceasefire or, or armistice or, or truce, or I mean, each one has it, its own term, right? Um, these three all are incomplete. And there's something else about these three that, that is in common, which is in all three of them, uh, um, the basic rules of, of global diplomacy are, are violated. The international community mobilizes itself not to do what conflict mediation usually does, which is to bring both sides to a better outcome through peaceful means than either one could hope to achieve through violent means, right? That's, that's the bedrock principle of conflict mediation. In fact, that's the bedrock principle of conflict mediation, not just in war. That's the bedrock principle of any kind of mediation, whether it's labor and management, whether it's a divorcing couple. But in, in, in any conflict, when you mediate, you want to bring the two sides to something that's better for both of them through mediation than any one of them could achieve uh, through open confrontation. Because otherwise, they'll go back to open confrontation. Wh whichever one of them could get a better result through open conflict will go, will go to that. And what happens in, in all three of those is a massive international diplomatic edifice that actually seeks to, um, you know, and, and we can maybe discuss later, you'll have questions why this is the case, uh, but seeks to somehow insulate the side that was agitating not for a war over a canal or a ridge or, uh, you know, a, or anything like that, but over the elimination of the other side, seeks to insulate it from its own defeat. Whether it's this uh, uh, monstrosity called UNRWA, which we can talk about at length later, um, but perhaps we don't need to. Um, whether it's the whole concept of land for peace. Um, uh, not that there's anything wrong in principle with, with withdrawing from occupied territory. That's often done in, in war. Um, but there's something very different about the, the, the post-67 diplomacy. Um, uh, especially as it becomes reinterpreted the farther we get from 67, um, or whether it's in the various uh, uh, attempts to correct for Camp David after 2000. And it's important maybe to focus on this. I wrote a different article a couple of years ago about uh, the peace processors, where I talked about the fundamental flaw of post-Camp David diplomacy. Every single peace plan that came up after Camp David, whether it's Taba, Geneva, Annapolis, um, or anything else, takes the side that rejected a previous compromise, initiated a violent confrontation, and was defeated in that confrontation, and offers that side better terms. If you did not know the names of those uh, belligerent parties, if you didn't know that one of them was Jewish and one of them was Arab, if you didn't know that this was about a, a, a patch of territory uh, on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, if you just knew that this was any conflict in the world, you would think that that is, excuse me, batshit crazy. There's nothing in the history of global diplomacy to support this kind of approach. It can only fail. Why can it only fail? Because if you're the losing side, remember the one that rejected a previous compromise, initiated a violent confrontation instead it was defeated, you have no reason to accept this because you're being rewarded for doing all those things. And if you're the winning side, you have no reason to even accept any kind of mediated offer because you're going to be in a worse position than what you've just achieved by defending yourself. In no conflict in the world would we adopt this approach. In none. 
And the fact that we keep adopting this approach and the fact that so much of our accumulated wisdom of conflict resolution is thrown out for this huge intellectualized edifice of global diplomacy that only applies to this one conflict shows that we're not actually thinking of conflict resolution. We're, we're acting on a deeply held moral and I would even say theological impulse. One that isn't guiding us very well. And one that we actually, we, not me, maybe not you either, but one that we as, a, as an intellectual community or as a political community shouldn't really be very proud of either. So what's the big thing that these three wars have in common? Right, We talked about a few smaller ones. For example, the centrality of Jerusalem, uh, the prominent place of eliminationism as a, as a war aim, and the fact that global diplomacy uh, erects these sui generis uh, edifices of um, uh, um, post-conflict uh, uh, diplomacy that uh, rather than uh, settling the conflict um, actually only seeks to preserve uh, the losing side from the consequences uh, of its own bellicosity. The big thing that, that these three wars have in common is that in the lead up to all three, there is on the Arab side a pure ecstasy about the upcoming violence that continues even into the initial stages of the violence. A real excitement, not just a violent excitement, but a, a righteousness, a, con a conviction that this new battle for revenge or whatever is morally pure and that the goal of eliminating a sovereign Jewish presence in the Middle East is the morally righteous one. And as soon as the defeat happens, all of that is effaced. And the war itself becomes remembered not as a war with a defeat, but as a story of pure victimhood. And I know as I'm saying this, you're thinking about uh, the evolution of the word Nakba, and we'll get to that in a second. But let's actually talk about a different one, one that's less prominent in our in our in our memories perhaps, right? Because I think it's actually instructive in so many ways. In 67, uh, the, the excitement about, about the, the, the war that, that was due to come in the weeks leading up to the 5th of June was enormous. Huge demonstrations in Cairo, a massive festive atmosphere. Um, and, um, and when it's over, of course, it's, it's remembered just as the, the Israeli aggression. When you say that to people, they tend to think, ah, okay, you know, these are you know, dictatorial regimes and um, they imagine these kind of quasi-Soviet societies where um, where the regime uh, using its official media organs lies to you and everybody has to pretend to believe it. But that's not capturing what happens here at all. These are not democratic societies by any means. Yeah, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, that's for sure. Um, but nor are they totalitarian societies. And the feeling of victimhood is genuine, it's real, not just at a popular level, at an elite level. The most uh, brilliant intellectuals in the Arab world and their partisans in the West who are not living in dictatorial regimes, who are not consuming uh, 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 official state media telling them lies and pretending to believe them because it's, it's expedient, genuinely feel that defeat as a case of victimhood. In fact, it's like everything in the 67 war, really rapid. It happens in weeks. In the case of 48, it's something that takes years, really crystallizes completely actually only after 50 years. Very much uh, 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 the similarity I always draw is with the, the, uh, the, the myth of the lost cause in, in after the US Civil War, which also, by the way, reaches its peak about 50 years after the, the end of that war. Um, uh, where a fundamentally racist and immoral war effort is reimagined as a noble cause um, against a uh, kind of soulless uh, northern uh, um, capitalism or whatnot. I mean, it's, it's sort of re-engineered in many in many ways. 
and mythologized, uh, again, both at an elite and a popular level, in Hollywood films, but also in how a lot of American history was written until the civil rights era. Um, so I had all, all these things in mind over the last three years. And why did I have it on my mind over the last three years? And why, um, I, I just, I started encountering it um, more and more and more uh, Palestinian intellectuals and pro-Palestinian intellectuals um, from 2020 onward, um, just uh, uh, really excited about how, well, you know, Israel was doomed to fall apart and the world was seeing it their way and there was no green line or occupation or anything to even be talking about two states and definitely not peace. Um, but there was just kind of a, a struggle against a, a, a malevolent regime whose existence is a crime, whose birth was a cosmic injustice, and that with a little push, it could really happen. So there's one more thing maybe that we should have said about all three wars because it became relevant in this one as well, is that in a very imp imperfect way, the anti-Zionist struggle or the Palestinian struggle, each each time it, it has a different, um, we can use a different terminology depending on the context, fits in to a larger girl, global struggle. And the struggle for an Arab Palestine fits into a larger global agenda, often always imperfectly, not always one that suits the Palestinian cause very well, not always one, by the way, that they've wanted all the way. So in 47, despite the fact that, it, 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 you know, in, in, in present day Soviet influenced anti-Zionist propaganda, Israel is of course a case of imperialism and whatnot. Actually, uh, um, the Arab cause in, in Palestine is, is in so many ways, uh, uh, one last front in the larger war that has been waged in the 1940s um, between the for forces of, of fascism and the very, very tenuous and problematic alliance between democracies and uh, uh, Soviet communist states. And in fact, the support for the Jewish cause in Palestine is led by liberal uh, democracies and the Soviet alliance, um, where the people who are most opposed are obviously what <laughs> remains of uh, various fascists, Nazis, and notably, uh, the big imperialists in uh, in Whitehall and and the State Department and uh, and the Cato say and, and elsewhere, um, and the Arab cause uh, in Palestine is embraced enthusiastically um, by unrepentant fascists and anti semites in Europe and those who have fled Europe, um, and in fact even the displacement that occurs. Um, in 1947, 48, and 49 is not terribly different um, in degree or in kind or in timing from what's happening in other nations that were aligned with the Germans in the war. Some because they were enthusiastic Nazis, some because they were really unlucky. You know, Finland or Bulgaria or, or whatever. And it's not even the last one. I mean, in my article, I talk about the Istrian exodus, which is more than a quarter million uh, Italians who are basically forced from their homes in what becomes uh, uh, Yugoslavia, now Croatia. Um, uh, and that's a process um, that uh, the, mo the bulk of it is actually um, in the early 1950s. The 1967 war is at the peak of the Cold War. And again, it maps very imperfectly uh, for example, Jordan, which is one of the um, uh, Arab belligerents, is definitely not a Soviet client state, although Egypt and Syria were. And Israel is not really an American client state yet. Um, uh, doesn't really have any major American weapon systems in its army uh, in 67 at all, actually, except for um, uh, uh, the anti-aircraft missiles, not its planes, not its bombs, not anything. Um, but it's perceived as that, and it's ideologized as part of the larger Cold War struggle. Um, and it's certainly ideologized in the Soviet sphere and in the non-aligned sphere now as uh, uh, an example of non-aligned and anti-imperialist countries 
against Western imperialism. And the Soviets do much to instigate the war. And the war that erupts in 2000 is very much a front in the larger conflict at the time between the West and jihadist Islam, which again, it's an imperfect mapping. In many ways, it becomes a burden for the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause, particularly a year later after 9-11. Um, it's not one, uh, as in the previous previous two, it's one that they are somewhat enthusiastic about, but not 100% sold in on. But in the other direction, there's 100% buy-in. And there's something of that happening here too. So I, I started talking about it in 2020. 2021 is a huge turning point where to me, it became obvious that we were headed to a fourth round. And there's a couple things that happened in 2021. So one was um, uh, I, I could see the intellectuals um, in the Palestinian territories, in, in the Arab world, and in the larger pro-Palestinian community, the enthusiasm that they had um, for the violence that erupted here in May of 2021 uh, during the last round of uh, Israel-Gaza conflict, and the incredible enthusiasm that they had about the intercommunal violence in Israel between Arabs and Jews, um, which they were absolutely convinced, proved that this was, you know, um, the real struggle. Palestinians on any side of the green line against these uh, uh, Jewish colonists. And that the whole concept of, of an Israeli state was unsustainable. And with a little bit of effort, we could bring it down. So it's important to remember just how wrong this was. I'm going to close this window here. Not five months after these events, uh, five months now, uh, something, I, I don't remember the exact, no, less than a year after these events. Joins the... Exactly. Uh, you, you know, there's, there's, there's something you can do uh, when you're curious about a country, which is learn about it go there, learn its language, encounter its people, read its best authors, uh, consume its culture, um, really get to know it in all its complexity. Or you can just project your, you know, moral categories on it um, uh, and, and, and especially uh, come to see it, um, uh, which is another way of doing it. Obviously the first method, the method is better than the second method. Um, for Israel, there's a, th a third method, um, which is just to imagine that everything about it is tainted and criminal and anything that you see that might contradict that actually just proves how tainted it is because they're, they're washing something. So the Israeli food is a sin, you know, an Israeli who eats a European food is proof that the Israelis are colonists. If he eats a Middle Eastern food, it's proof that they're appropriating. The anger people have in activist circles when they see something described as Israeli food. By the way, if somebody gets angry that they see a falafel described as Israeli, the most important thing you can do right away is ask them, well, what is it? Because if somebody says it's Syrian and somebody else says it's Egyptian, you say, does it make you angry when the guy who says it's Syrian says it's Egyptian? Because you got angry when somebody said it was Israeli. If they say it's Jordanian, if they say it's Palestinian, like, well, what is it? Because it doesn't seem to make them angry that it's the wrong, you know, I mean, the, Greeks and Bulgarians argue about feta without the fact that they're arguing about it being proof that Bulgarians are evil. I mean, there's something else going on there. So yes, I mean, this was this was a complete misreading of the uh, situation um, that's, uh, that, that you get when you're um, subordinating your uh, study of, of, of an entire society to... Um, to the prior belief that everything about it is, is criminal and tainted. And the other thing that happened in 2021 was the apartheid reports. A whole slew of human rights organizations came out with reports that year in those months, uh, uh, arguing that Israel um, was uh, essentially an apartheid regime. And there's something really curious about that happening too. 
Um, not just because it's uh, wrong. I mean, Alan is the expert here and he can uh, explain just how wrong um, that uh, line of argument is uh, much better than I can. But it's not just that they're wrong. It's that they were all wrong at the same time and that nothing happened. I mean, the legal status of Israel and the territories changes dramatically with different wars and things like that. The advent of the occupation in 67 really dramatically changes the legal status of these places. You, you can see how that might cause you to, 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 to look for new legal categories. The, the, um, the creation of the civil administration in the early 1980s, uh, maybe you could say that too, I don't know. Um, the, the, uh, um, the Oslo process and the creation of areas A, B, and C, um, the second intifada arguably, even the, the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza and then the, the um, in 2005 and the coup that brings Hamas to power in 2007, those change the legal and the juridical status quo of these territories. Since 2007, nothing has changed, for better or for worse. In fact, looking back at 100 years of Arab-Jewish interaction in this land, 2007 to, to now, that's about 16 years. That may be the longest juridical status quo, certainly since the mandate. So if nothing changed, how did all these organizations come to a conclusion that the threshold was crossed at that time in, in 2021 without apparently having coordinated with each other? It's not that they sat in a secret meeting and came to this conclusion. It's not that they had some donor who was asking for this, you know, or something like that. They really all did. I mean, it's genuine. In the same way we were talking about the, 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 the post-67 memory adjustment, the, this was genuine. So partly it's because anti-Israel activism is a social activity. It's an affirmation of faith. It's a theology for people who claim that they don't have a church. Um, it's a theology that looks really familiar, by the way, to people who did go to church, um, particularly in its emphasis on a people apart um, who rejected uh, a, a universal vision of peace and stand in the way of our achieving it. And while we condemn violence against them, we certainly have a lot of understanding for the people who carry it out. Uh, cynically, I think it also was a bit of a nervousness about the, the um, possibility of normalization agreements between Israel and the Arab states. Um, but, but mostly it was that. And I, and I think that was that the combination of those things, the fact that the internal intellectual dynamic in Palestinian society was absolutely incapable of re revisiting the decisions in 20, 2000 and 2001. There, there is no discourse about, was this good to reject Camp David? There is no embattled minority of left-wingers and activists saying, ah, we should have done that. And the Intifada was bad. It doesn't exist. It's not an unpopular view. It just isn't a view. And again, you you, you can excuse this as uh, under the, the, the category of non-democracy as much as you want, but it's not a view, you know, in London or or, or New York in, in pro-Palestinian circles. It's not something discussed. It's not even a view to be rejected. The question, are we better off having rejected Camp David and gone to the Second Intifada, isn't asked because the idea that the Palestinians are a subject of a sentence with a verb, that Palestinian outcomes are connected to Palestinian actions, decisions, beliefs, and choices. To even suggest that is to excuse yourself from the community of pro-Palestinians. It's a violation of one of the fundamental tenets of this of the theology of anti-Israel activism. So to see that over 20 years, there wasn't the most minimal introspection in self-criticism. There wasn't the most minimal engagement with the course of events and the decisions that led to the catastrophe in 2000, 2001, to say nothing of what led to the catastrophe in 67 or the catastrophe of 47, 48. And that on the contrary, there was a new generation of some extremely bright people, by the way. I mean, I, I read them. I, I see them all the time in the London Review of Books and the New York Review of Books 
and uh, not just in English, of course, um, people who consider themselves to be very liberal, not jihadists, people who hang out at the coolest parties when they're in London and in New York and in Paris, you know, very sophisticated types. To read them in the last three years was to understand that that this is where they were headed. When the global community in its previous incarnations, either unrepentant fascists or uh, uh, Soviet agitators or, or Islamist jihadists, um, but now uh, a, a global community of intersectional decolonizing uh, woke activists and intellectuals come with the, the same approach. Again, there's not 100% purchase and buy-in. And there's a lot of Israelis who who like to score cheap points by talking about how stupid queers for Gaza is like that. And it is stupid. I mean, um, but it's also not as central to, to, to what's happening. There isn't 100% buy-in. Um, mm. uh, I, I don't think that uh, Yichia Sinwar is a, is a, is a, a campus woke activist or anything. Um, uh, and he ultimately is the one who who made the decision uh, uh, to to launch uh, this uh, horrible operation on October seventh. But in the other direction, uh, there absolutely is. Um, so the anti-Israel cause is the totemic cause for that global intellectual milieu, in the same way it was for the previous three incarnations. And it's disastrous for the people it's claiming to help. Absolutely catastrophic. And this is the fourth time now. Sorry, should I start us off with a question, Kala? Um, I should preface the question, I think, Shani, thanks very much for that fant fantastic presentation. Um, we are all two staters of long standing in this discussion. And we've argued for the two state solution from the heights of the political uh, echelon in Israel to getting screamed at on campuses in the UK and everything in between. And we've done that for about, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. OK, so that's that's who we are. Um, and it's in that context. Um, I want to ask a question, which is what I thought was so powerful about the piece was that it's something that I've been thinking about probably for a decade, which is what is the Palestinian national movement? H how should we be characterizing it? Is it a national liberation movement at all? If not, what is it? Because what I got from your paper, almost overarching your analysis of the three wars was, I think it's a statement early on when you say, when given the chance to establish the state, they have rejected it time and again. And there's a sense that, I think you call it a hierarchy of goals in that, okay, there's, there's, a, there's a goal apparently, ostensibly, um, which is concerned with the absence of a desired nation state for us. But I think you point out that that has always taken second, third, fourth place to the opposition to a continued existence of a national state for them. So consequently, in pursuit of that goal, as you say, there's been these ecstatic, righteous wars, a strategic, disastrous in every case, setting back the Palestinian cause hugely in every case, but then somehow reinterpreted as um, pure victimhood in the aftermath. And this has left the Palestinian national movement where it is. Um, and you tell victim us- Victimhood does not mean that a defeat is actually a moral victory. E exactly. So questions so would be- what, what sense are we to make of what the Palestinian national movement is? Because I think I've spent a lot of my life assuming it was a national liberation movement and my politics being around two states for two peoples based on that. I, I'm not convinced at all anymore that what I'm looking at when I look at the Palestinian national movement is a national liberation movement that seeks a nation state. I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but I no longer think I'm looking at that. 
So my question is, what, what is it for you? And secondarily, what is Israel supposed to do about any of this? If diplomacy, as you say, I think in the paper, becomes scrambled, inverted and abused when we're in this framework, and if it's the case that Israel's not interested in national suicide, which it's not, where, do, where does Israel go in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute from here if what it's dealing with is a movement that isn't pursuing a nation state, but is pursuing the eradication of another nation state? Where does it go? Right. Okay, so if I accidentally neglect to answer the second question, you have to remind me. I'll start with the first question. Um, um, second question is a bit easier to answer. So let's do the first one. And I think the first one really hinges on the difference between the Israeli-Palestinian dispute and the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And, um, and there's enormous difference between what those things mean and how we conceive of the Palestinian national movement depending on which of those two frameworks we're thinking in. If we were just thinking in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as on its own, then it is possible to see the Palestinian movement as a national liberation movement, like any other. It's not hugely different from the others. And even the fact that it's made tactical blunders, so you're right, they rejected statehood a bunch of times um, and, and were worse off it's terrible, by the way. It 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 shows really poor leadership. But even that's not unusual. Lots of national liberation movements have poor leadership and make bad decisions, including ours. Yeah, including Israel. Um, there are a lot of na national liberation movements that make poor decisions. There are a lot of national liberation movements that reject uh, 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 outcomes um, and 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 prefer war and then end up with something that's worse. It's a tragic tale. It's so typical. It, 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 it's not even unusual. And you can basically you pick apart all of these uh, post-imperial spaces, especially in the post-Ottoman space that we're in. It's actually re re really common. Look at hey, let, let me just say, they, they don't make the same mistake again and again and again and again. If you take the IRA, you know, the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement is sometimes called Sunningdale for Slow Learners. OK, they, they had an offer in the 70s, which they rejected. They then... They, at some point, and I spoke to these people at the time, at some point they understood it was a dead end and they had to go down a different route. What, what, the Palestinian movement seems to make the same set of mistakes again and again and again, including on, from October the 7th, an absolutely well, disastrous, astrategic uh, action. I mean, why? Right. And that's because it, the Palestinian movement, as we're experiencing and seeing it, isn't just a national liberation movement. And understanding it as, as just one uh, party of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict actually misses something. Um, uh, the Palestinian national movement does not behave as a national liberation movement, which would require, and I just want to finish another thing, another thing that's very typical for national liberation movements is that they end up with a lot less than what they wanted, sometimes even geographically, places that have huge historical importance in a nation's history are outside of its borders when it achieves modern statehood. Yeah, Constantinople, I'm not even gonna name the nation that claims, because there's like three for whom it's a hugely important city in their mythology, and it's not in any of those three. Um, Poland's probably two of its most important sort of mythological sites are, are Vilna and, and Lvov. Uh, but one is uh, uh, today in Ukraine, and the other is, uh, is the capital city of, of a neighboring country. Um, Vilnius. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and again, that's so true of, of uh, nation states that emerge out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and of the Ottoman Empire and, and of, of, of so many others. So in that sense, a uh, Palestinian state that emerges in the West Bank and Gaza and doesn't have uh, Jaffa where I'm right now or, or Akko or places like that isn't unusual. Just by the same way that the uh, Jewish state that accepted uh, um, borders that didn't even include Jerusalem in 47. Didn't even include the Western half, didn't, even, didn't just didn't include Jerusalem in the Jewish state and was still accepted, um, is uh, painful, but, but not unusual. And again, not unusual is making a bad choice. I think that the Jewish leadership in 47 made a very good choice and that the, the Arab leadership in Palestine made a very bad choice. 
But there are other times, by the way, when the, the Zionist leadership has made very stupid choices, often for the same reasons in the sense of being overly optimistic about its uh, cap capabilities in war, um, driven by too much fanaticism, confused about the role of religion. We, we've made plenty of dumb uh, choices and not just us. Okay, but none of that captures, as you are hinting in your question, none of that captures the essential difference of the, of the Palestinian national movement from all these other national liberation causes, including the clumsiest um, and, and most uh, un, uh, hapless uh, uh, or poorly executed ones. And that's because the Palestinian national movement has not been fundamentally a national liberation movement. It has been a national elimination movement. And that's because thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict misses something very big. Um, and, and that the real sting of what has been so catastrophic for the Palestinians has been their role in the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Arab-Israeli conflict has been predicated on the notion that Israel is a cosmic evil, not a state that we have a territorial dispute with, but something whose very existence is a gross crime against all human beings everywhere. So for decades, even the word Israel couldn't be enunciated. And, and not only was it boycotted, um, right? I mean, lots of countries have, have disputes. They still trade with each other. They still even sometimes have tourists and things like that, sometimes very hostile borders. Our borders with the Arab world were completely sealed until we started having peace treaties many decades later. I mean, even now, uh, 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 traveling to Israel is, is, is a taboo in the Arab world among the few countries that have peace with us. Um, any cultural exchange almost doesn't exist. Um, and any discussion of Israel is always about its essential evil and criminality. What was the Palestinian nation was, was essentially the victims of the Arab defeat in 48. That's what defines you as a Palestinian. The, 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 the borders that define historic Palestine that we keep hearing have nothing to do with any previous Arab or Ottoman line. They're the lines of the British mandate for a Jewish national home, which don't conform except on the Israeli-Egyptian border to any pre-existing line. They cut right through historic Ottoman vilayets and Sanjaks. When your cause is liberation, even painful territorial compromise is worth it for your own freedom. That's how Jews behaved in 47. That's how Armenians and Bulgarians and Greeks and Turks and Tunisians and every other newly formed modern nation state behaved. Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, when your goal is the elimination of another nation, then any compromise, even a generous one, isn't worth it. You haven't actually gained anything. This is why I'm such a big believer in pursuing, where possible, more peace agreements between Israel and Arab states, because I think that the best thing that can happen to the Palestinian cause is to take out the cosmic sting of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict, people always say how complicated it is. And how, you know what? There are some complicated conflicts in the world. This one really isn't. If I didn't show you any lines on the map, okay? I didn't show you the uh, armistice lines from 49, and I didn't show you the ceasefire lines from 67. I didn't show you the, the Oslo patchwork from Oslo 2 and areas A, B, and C. Just gave you a map with the, the demographic layout of, of the land, with blue dots for, for concentrations of, of Jews and, and green dots for concentrations of Arabs, you could probably draw a decent border for two states. Yeah. It's not unsolvable. Even Jerusalem has some reasonable compromises. It's not one of the unsolvable conflicts in the world. It can be done. If it's just a question of... of territorial claims and a few other issues like that, water, resources, defense packs, things like that, all the issues are solvable. What's not solvable, like I said, is that the, the Palestinians are, are, are being asked to bear the sting of this, this cosmic defeat um, and, and, and this uh, 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 limitless evil um, that is how uh, Israel is conceived in, in the Arab world. And if we can eliminate that sting and basically just get down to drawing a line on the map where it's really simple to do. It's not so complicated. There'll be a few points that are a bit difficult. There will be a few 
creative solutions that need to be found. There will certainly have to be Israeli settlements in the West Bank that are evacuated. Um, and uh, But that's the psychological hurdle that hasn't, that hasn't ever been overcome. Now, there has definitely been in, on the Israeli side and in the Zionist side before statehood uh, a kind of denialism about um, the Arab claims to this land, about the existence of a Palestinian people. That hasn't been the easiest thing for Israelis to come, come to terms with. Um, and some on the right and far right actively resisted to this day. But on the Palestinian side, there is nothing like that. I mean, there, there is zero acknowledgement anywhere of the legitimacy of another national movement here. We keep looking for October for the, the, the explanation of October 7th in some kind of Israeli action. It's the blockade, it's this, whoever. There's this reluctance, I think, for so many outside to say, this is what Hamas believes. This is the political society it comes from. This is where its base of support is. People who went around and committed these atrocities recorded themselves doing it to boast of their actions. They understood something about their own societies that we're terrified of acknowledging. And they understood something about the cause that they serve that we're terrified of acknowledging. I mean, I'm a bit speechless now, Shani, to be honest. Uh, and there's so many different directions we could take this. Um, we've already taken up an hour of your time. So I feel like unless Alan has any other um, urgent question, we, we should probably park this and maybe there'll be um, a part two at some stage kind of looking forward. I was going to ask you, you know, because you talked about the, um, the falafel thing. I was then going to ask you, which country um, does Alexander the Great belong to? Um, but and maybe we should we should also park that for another time. So I, um, I ask if you Thomas Paine belongs to and can't get we can't get to an agreement. Right, right. But I think I think you know as 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 you said, the 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 post empire reality in both the Balkans and and the post Ottoman Empire reality is full of these kind of multi ethnic areas that are still trying to find their their place uh, in a post-empire reality and, and you know you can look northwards and eastwards and and, and whichever way we, whichever way we want and we see you know different ethnic groups who are who are fighting it out um anyway thank you it's it's always a pleasure and i always think shani you are consistently excellent um in in your both in your long form and in your very short twitter form as well um and well done for another fantastic essay and thank you for spending your time with us and we hope to uh re-engage with you soon thank you very much for having me thanks Shanae.